Um, yeah, so my name's Ben. I've been running Groovy now for 10 years and uh, we're a media and tech agency that's really focused on the entertainment space. So we work across film, television, um, cinema, streaming, uh, video on demand. Um, and we've also started working within the gaming space as well, primarily with indie, indie games. And we've always been fascinated by the way that audiences move around. Um, you know their behaviors and how those behaviors can be used to uh, to improve a, a marketing campaign. Um, one of the other things that we're very sort of passionate about is the information that's available within the industry. So you know during the pandemic or right at the beginning of the pandemic, we decided to take a very much information first approach to the market. So we've started the regular web series or mini TV show called That's Entertainment. Um, and, you know, by all means, follow me there. We're talking about new stuff every week. You know, we're regularly running webinars. We're also doing hackathons within the film industry because one of the things that's come out of this research is just how uh, out of touch the business of film distribution and exhibition is in comparison to production. You know, production is, I think, where the entrepreneurs are sitting within the industry. Um, there's a lot of exciting movement in terms of different ways of uh, shooting films, raising money. You know, we're starting to hear things like NFTs creeping into uh, film production. Um, and the, I think one of the, the challenges that the industry really faces now is they're still very much trying to apply business models and approaches that were kind of developed in the 40s and 30s um, to today's world where we have the Internet. And, you know, obviously the Internet is an absolute game changer. Um, but everyone was making money up until COVID uh, hit. And I think COVID has been the great accelerant on a lot of the, you know, um, parts of the business model that were slowly dying off. Um, there's been some major changes there. So today's presentation is really to go through, you know, three fundamental uh, sections in this report. The first one is where are we now and how did we get there? And then we'll look at the cinema industry and the TV and VOD industry. And we'll make some predictions at the end of this presentation that you can hold me account to in 10 years time. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll see where we are with that. But um, we've tried to aggregate as much information, not only from our own sources and our own campaign data, you know, and our experience with clients on the ground, but also, you know, our colleague businesses within the market, plus, you know, all the great press that's out there, you know, with all the interesting updates that have been following. So without further, much further ado, let's dive straight in. So, um, key point, cinema was in decline in the West and has been for quite some time. Um, and it's funny, when I, when I raised this slide across the world, you know, I, if I'm doing it in Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe or um, Central Europe, uh, in, particularly around uh, countries like uh, Poland and Czech, the, um, you know, the response is no, our audiences are growing and, you know, there's a wide audience for film. But what I'm trying to show here is the markets of UK, France, Germany, Italy, which were traditionally the first film markets ever to really get going, uh, and the US. Uh, amongst certain demographics, there's been a massive decline in, or you know, very notable decline in the number of uh, uh, tickets sold. What's interesting, though, is that the profits from uh, film and uh, exhibition have been growing. So we have a strange conundrum within the industry where if less people are buying tickets, but profits are rising, it means the cost per ticket is has increased and you know, therefore, what is the value to the audience at the end of the day? You know, if things are becoming more expensive to get to, then, you know, it's not a good position to be in economically. And the key, uh, key demographic that we're seeing that's kind of dropping out of the cinema experience is the young, sort of people between the ages of 14 and 25. Um, and this, this is probably the demographic which is probably the most underserved by cinemas in the West. Obviously, you know, with the pandemic, we've had a massive explosion of streaming services um, filling the void with, uh, as cinemas closed. So on the other side of the industry, we're now starting to see 
you know, films going directly into the home entertainment um, window. Um, and, you know, this term PVOD, which you're going to see everywhere, um, is in relation to something called premium VOD. It's a very important thing to understand about the value chain of film, that film is, as I said, quite an archaic business model. But the value chain of film is producers make the content and raise the funds. Sales agents in the middle between distribution and producers manage you know, a, a portfolio of films that they then take around to people who buy the rights, which are the distributors. Um, studios like uh, Fox or Arrow Films in the UK, you know, are good examples of distribution. And what distributors do is they, they look at monetizing each window that the film is available in. And the concept of windowing is one of the key things uh, within film that most producers are kind of aware of, but they don't really have an idea of how badly or, you know, how restrictive this policy has been in the business of movies. One of the key reasons why, um, you know, you'll have to, prior to the pandemic, wait for a film to be released into like the home entertainment window is this idea that, you know, um, distributors are trying to maximize value. So are cinemas. Uh, the longer that they can hold a film in the uh, theatrical window, um, the more exclusive it feels. Obviously they're not counting online piracy. We had this rather archaic system which kind of dictated through no laws, but just through business practice, how films were released. And so a distributor's role was to manage the relationship between the sales agent, the cinemas, and also do all the advertising uh, for the movie and all the promotion. But the distributor never actually meets a client or an audience member, that's down to, you know, the exhibition team or the guys working at the cinemas. So you can see from start to finish, um, no one's really that um, focused on the audience. And that's one of the reasons why film marketing and film advertising, you know, tends to focus more on awareness rather than the performance of tickets sold. Because if we look at the business model of cinema, it's the, the, the ticket sales are almost the lost leader. They're there to get people into a location where they can sell concessions, which is where they make the majority of their money. So that's why the, the, the business value chain of film is so incredibly complicated and hasn't really innovated um, for the last 60 years. So along comes COVID. It wrecks the cinema industry, forcing us into lockdowns. Obviously, cinemas were one of the first, you know, institutions or business institutions that, that shut down. Um, and in the meantime, a whole series of other release strategies were tried. And one of the key ones was this concept of premium VOD. And this is the studios trying to step into the breach and try and maintain an exclusive price point on their product for a limited release. Um, where you're either buying the content or you're premium renting it. And the price points, you know, will, uh, have started to become fixed now, but it's generally around about £15 to, um, to rent um, in the high end for, uh, for, for premium VOD. What the, the other main thing that the pandemic has driven is, a, is this incredible year-on-year -year growth in terms of all um, sales of digital content because you know, we've all been locked at home and you know, as we've exhausted our Netflix subscriptions, you know, all of a sudden this premium VOD and transactional VOD, you know, renting or buying you know, more uh, newer films has become possible. And so how did this all start? Well, the first film that kind of broke the mold was last year was Trolls, uh, the world tour. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we plotted a timeline of the events that kind of happened, but this was really the first litmus test and, uh, and really the, you know, the, uh, the moment where the cinema industry was, was forced into recognition that, you know, the, the tables had literally turned on them, that they didn't have any negotiating power without their, their facilities being open. 
So when uh, Universal made the announcement that they were going direct to um, video on demand with a PVOD release of World, uh, Trolls World Tour, and that was a PVOD rental at, I think it was about 15 or 16 pounds, um, AMC came out and basically said, well, Universal will never be able to show another film in a Universal cinema. So that was uh, May and April sort of flack that uh, in 2020 last year that sort of erupted. And then over the course of that, uh, you know, uh, cold shower, the, um, the industry began to negotiate with itself. And as you can see, sort of later in, in the year, AMC returns to the negotiating table and the windows are agreed as I'll show you later, although dramatically shortened. Um, and in the meantime, other films were being released, but because the focus and the attention was thrown at Universal and Trolls, other studios then used that opportunity to start uh, their own negotiations and their own trials. And of course, we'll be alluding to those over the course of the year. The Trolls is really the important one because it kind of broke the mold. It created the most pushback from the industry as the industry was beginning to find its feet in, uh, in the lockdown. And uh, you know, now we're up to uh, companies like Warner and HBO Max and Disney and Disney Plus doing day and date releases on their own services because they've you know, effectively rushed forward their own platforms. So I think the key point from this slide is trolls really sh uh, showcase to the industry where the power lay and the power lies with the studios and their content during these lockdowns. Of course, you know, as I mentioned, there have been all kinds of alternative models that are being tried and we've got some new studios on the block now with Netflix, uh, Apple and Prime. Um, a lot of these are trying theatrical releases alongside the, the releasing of the films on their own platforms. And I think essentially what you can look at these, you know, big players as the new studios on the block. Um, essentially very, very interesting because they're driving a lot of competition within the market, particularly for one segment of the film industry, which has been the mid-tier movie element, which has largely dropped out of, uh, out of um, you know, the Hollywood production cycle because traditionally a mid-tier is the biggest risk movie that you, can, that you can make. So anything sort of between the 25 million to 100 million dollar mark has always been viewed as a particularly risky endeavor by Hollywood. And we're now seeing a resurgence of the mid-tier movie through new uh, services um, like Apple TV. As I mentioned earlier, we're also seeing, um, you know, this change in, um, in release patterns. So we had the announcement from Warner Brothers that all of their 2021 slate will be released directly to HBO Max at the same time as being available within cinemas, and that's for the ones that are open. Um, so they're not saying um, we're holding back our slate. They're being quite proactive, and I think um, uh, Killar did a good job of pushing through this idea, although there's some controversy within the industry in terms of how it was done, because when you release a film into theaters, the chances for merchandising and product placement are, you know, are much more um, profit friendly and the opportunity is much higher than if the film releases directly uh, to say premium VOD. So as part of this experimentation, we're seeing the established studios and some of the new studios from TV beginning to cross over and try different release strategies. And probably what we will see over the rest of 2021 is, you know, Disney and uh, uh, Warner continuing with their, you know, day and day release on VOD platforms and in cinemas. And we might see other studios attempting to mimic, mimic this, maybe even Universal pushing back on their uh, arrangements that they have with AMC. So, you know, these are some of the titles that have been promised to be simultaneous. Um, Black Widow being the most notable is that's the one that keeps on getting pushed back. But the important thing is that very soon, we're, once the cinemas reopen in the UK, we're going to have to start to have some good content in there as well. And I think that that breathes a lot of hope back into the industry. Um, I would have been more concerned if the studios had completely held off and then we were only left with a few independent films each uh, each month 
I don't think that would have been enough to drive real in interest in, uh, in returning to the cinema. So I think the catalogue's there, you know, it's interesting, there's some big films, uh, and, you know, I think this would be great for the industry. So, one of the key things that we've been watching out for is how um, excited our audience is to return to cinemas, because, you know, that was one of the big questions within the industry is, well, with the shuttering of cinemas, are we driving away the habit of returning to, to, uh, to cinemas once the pandemic ends? Um, and so far, all the, the data that's coming out of the markets that are open, like China, are very good. What we're seeing is, you know, nationalist content in China is doing extremely well. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing that in Australia, which is COVID free at the moment, that, you know, they, the, the second iteration of Wonder Woman um, performed 110% better than the previous movie. Um, which is very indicative that once cinemas do reopen, people will be looking forward to going back out, although they'll be socially distanced. And I think, you know, the, the seating arrangements are between 35 and 50% occupancy, depending on which country you're in. The good news is from the markets that are open, in the moment something, you know, from the mainstream does hit these cinemas, audiences do come flooding in which is one of the main reasons why we think all the studios are push, are pulling back the big releases like No Time to Die has had, I think, three separate um, opening opportunities to only be pulled back last minute on each occasion. Um, and again, the main reason for this is these, these movies are such massive investments. You know, I think uh, within No Time to Die, you know, there's several very important brand product placements, including Heineken. I think No Time to Die also had uh, special specialty Heineken beers printed <laughs> for the uh, bottles printed for, for, for the release of this film. And therefore, you know, the, 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 the key thing that we're starting to see is we're probably going to see a future of blockbusters continuing at massive scale. And for those types of films, the theatrical release will be the most important thing. Um, so I think that's quite hopeful for the industry, but we're, we're going to see big productions like the James Bond franchise, like the Aliens franchise, um, continuing. Dune is something obviously I'm very excited about because there's a whole, a whole story there that I think needs to be told on the big screen. Um, and these special big movies are gonna maintain their theatrical window to new standards, but um, you know, it'll be theaters first uh, and exclusively. The main reason for this is, you know, the theatrical release is the main gauging point for all downstream revenues for the film currently. And we don't really have a valuation model that can, uh, that can correctly value the, uh, the movie in future windows. So as a film moves into its, into its home entertainment window and then starts to hit TV and SVOD services, um, everything was gauged around the premiere night for film. And a lot of audience recognition also comes from a good premiere. So without a film premiere, it's very difficult to value uh, films downstream. And so one of the interesting things we noted from the Trolls release was Trolls didn't make it into the top 10 uh, for um, 2020. Most of the films that did had big box office releases in 2019 or early 2020. So there does seem to be an indication that the theatrical release is very important for audience recognition and uptake um, of these films. And the principal reason for that is when we actually start to look into the economics of you know, uh, premium VOD distribution, on one side, the studio retains more of the profit. They don't have to share that with the, uh, uh, with the cinemas. Um, typically tickets are split either 60-40 or 50-50 or 30-70, but there's a split, a revenue split between the cinema and the, uh, the distributor. And without that in place, um, the main value of streaming is that the distributors get to retain the majority of the spends. Um, I think in Troll's case, it was upwards of 80%. 
But the uh, downside is that there isn't a global distribution mechanism for something like Trolls. So Trolls, when it released, it went on to Comcast, which is part of the universal um, umbrella of companies. Um, and you know, in America, it made a lot of money for the studio. But as we can see on the international spending on um, in comparison, we're looking at 193 million versus three. And that's a very important differentiation. Uh, the, you know, the sale of content on various platforms with it, without it being, you know, a direct channel like Comcast has to US consumers. It's a very, you know, each studio has different plethora of things that they're using to release the movies. Um, but without the international support, the trolls didn't really make that much money outside of the US. And I think that's one of the key reasons why we're going to see a continuation of the theatrical window as being the all important, you know, pusher for big blockbuster movies. But then we're going back into this idea of windows. And of course, you know, if you're following Stephen Follows, you know, who's uh, producing some excellent research in the film industry, um, one of the, the, the things or the main changes that we've seen is this attitude towards this windowing. Um, and as you can see, exhibition is the, is the one industry that's, uh, that's pushing back the most, although there is some agreement that windows need to change. It's really the filmmakers and sales and distribution and the home entertainment industries that are interested in the windows opening up. And therefore, what's been agreed from the Trolls deal with AMC is, you know, 17 days or three weekends for titles opening under $50 million and 31 days or five weekends for anything over $50 million. And other studios have other approaches. So Paramount's a 45-day window on select titles. Disney's looking at simultaneous and theatrical plus, Dis uh, plus Disney Plus for some, certain premiere releases. Warner Brothers has got the HBO Max service and Sony is, has done a, a deal directly with Netflix as we just found out recently. Um, and it's the only studio that hasn't invested massively in their own VOD platform. Um, and I think there's some logic for that because you know, one of the things that we're facing is an increasingly crowded home entertainment market. We went from you know, five, six years ago, virtually nothing that was online to, you know, in the UK, now TV, HBO, um, Netflix, and many, many other services. So we are in the, the process of a streaming war and uh, Paramount Plus is the latest addition uh, to, this, to this marketplace. So it'd be very interesting to see how these services sort of uh, progress over the next few years. But the, the question about windowing is, is largely a mute one. As I said, you know, we, we've known for some time that COVID has been a great accelerant to a lot of these things that we knew needed to change. So in the previous to um, uh, the, the lockdown, windowing for the theatrical release could be anything between 90 and 45 days before it would be available on, in the home entertainment window. But when we looked at Box Office Mojo and plotted all the the films in the US and the UK that had released, what we found was outside of a few anomalies, most films, and this is 99% of films, in their third to fourth week only make 5% uh, percent of the box office. So the majority of the profits are really in the premiere week and following week. And then once you're up into the third and fourth week, the film's not really making money anymore. So there is a business logic to say that, you know, a, a 30 day window or a 17 day window does actually make sense. And I think where cinemas now are having to look at going in, in, in terms of figuring out what the competition is, and I, and I believe Tim League here, you know, the, the, the cinema isn't competing with the VOD market. The cinema is competing with the outdoor market, you know, you have a certain amount of money that you want to spend and a certain amount of free time. And it's a choice between going to sports, going to the pub with your friends, going to a restaurant, going to a concert, or going to the cinema. And that, that's where cinema needs to be, you know, fighting its battles. And I think what we're going to start to see as a result of this realization is a range of innovations finally 
happening within the cinema sector um, that will be very important for you know the industry uh, going forwards. And to you know give that example right now, um, when we looked at uh, the tickets sold for Tenant, what what we suddenly realised was every man um, cinema chain was was responsible for ten percent of that market share. In comparison to the market share that every man has in relation to View, Cine World, and Odeon, it's it's tiny. But every man has always focused on high quality locations, very comfortable seating, very friendly service, and a kind of very trendy vibe with with each of their locations and their website presence. And that's I think what's going to happen once the lockdown ends. The the punters that are willing to go back to the cinemas are going to be much more discerning of the location um we saw that um you know imax figures for sales across the markets that are open have done extremely well in japan china australia you know those locations have sold out quite regularly and again i think the viewing experience will be more discerning now for punters that are looking to go out and you know enjoy the experience of cinema and so, you know, the operators that are running old dilapidated cinemas are going to really have to look at some form of investment to get the screening up, you know, look at the design of their cinemas, make sure that there are areas catering, catering for different requirements that different groups have coming in. And obviously the screening and sound technology is part of the experience. But you can see, um, you know, the approach by every man and, and um uh, you know, the other chains in the UK that have invested in the experience of the actual cinema has really paid off. And Picture House, you know, I remember having a chat with one of the senior team there, were explaining to me that whenever they go and open a new location, the first thing they do is go and make friends with the local council and try and figure out what the local council requires. And I, you know, I used to go to the Picture House in, in Brixton. And it's quite interesting when you go into there on a Saturday and Sunday morning, they're doing things for the local families in that area. You know, it's really like a culture house for the for the community. Um, so I think cinema still has that very important role in urban areas of getting people together. But I really do think it will be the cinemas that are focused on the experience that will really be doing extremely well after the lockdown ends. So, you know, part of what we alluded to right at the beginning of this presentation was the younger audiences are, you know, not coming into the cinema experience in the same ways as they did in the past in the West. Um, Gen Z, you know, is distracted to say the least with all the various entertainment opportunities that they have out there. And I think there's, you know, some great quotes here from, you know, uh, Kamal uh, Nanjiani, um, when I think he's quite right in saying that, you know, if he'd grown up in the time of YouTube, he probably would have, you know, also not treated uh, cinema as the high priority I did as a kid, you know, with movies like Goonies and Indiana Jones and Gremlins being things that would just, you know, I'd be chomping on the bit to get out the door and go and see. Um, one thing that I think is quite interesting from this is uh, when, um, uh, the stat of browsing the internet being 12% of the time is mentioned. I think that accounts in large part to services like YouTube, Twitch, you know, all these video services that have exploded in the last 10 years that offer such a rich variety of content that I believe children are watching a huge range of uh, creator friendly uh, channels. And uh, I think that is an interesting opportunity uh, in the production market too, and something that we should all be looking at. Because I, I would say in the streaming wars, YouTube is probably one of the unsung heroes. That doesn't get any mention alongside Netflix or HBO. But when you look at bandwidth and traffic, you know, and if I look at my own case study of my own children, it's their go-to service alongside, alongside Twitch. But as been shown by recent updates in the box office in the US, if you put on the right kinds of content, people will come. And, you know, we've had the Mortal Kombat movie and then the Demon Slayer anime uh, movie that did extremely well in Japan was their biggest box office to date. Um, 
do also extremely well in the US. So if you're putting on the right kinds of content, it is actually very easy to attract younger audiences into these shows. And that's part of the experience that I think cinemas should be looking to focus on in the future. So I think there are opportunities with esports. I also think there are huge opportunities with event cinema. And again, probably what we're going to start to see is innovation on the you know, cinema side where you know, the idea that you have a room full of seats, but for a music concert, people like to stand up and dance. Maybe we'll be facing a future where the seats disappear into the ground and you actually have a concert venue. Um, with the esports sides of things, we've been seeing, you know, with the events that we've attended, the cinemas leaving the lights on, concessions actually being sold back in the room, just like they were back in the in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's, there's just going to be a lot of innovation happening within the way, not only within the slate that uh, the cinemas will be putting together, but also within the, um, uh, the way that the actual experience of cinema is constructed as well. And these are the two areas, I think, that potentially give cinemas some really interesting content, uh, gaming and, uh, and event cinema. And then, you know, from our webinar last week, you know, I think it's worth a little push here. You know, uh, Cinematastic was one of the companies that we were trying to bring in to a series of webinars where we're looking at the technology for, for improving the, um, uh, the experience and making the whole uh, point of visiting a cinema more exciting. Um, so they released a whole series of games apps into the, uh, in, into the, into the environment that have been well and truly tested in, in Denmark. Uh, where the company's based. And this, these are, you know, games and opportunities and, and promotions that run prior to the film, you know, uh, starting. Uh, and these games are interactive. And I think this is just another example of, you know, the, the fact that you have an auditorium with lots of people sitting in there with mobile phones. So, now moving into the streaming side of things. As I mentioned previously, we've seen massive growth in subscribers to all streaming services in the UK. So um, we're now up to 32 million subscribers out of a population of I think 64 or 65 million people in the United Kingdom. It's truly incredible considering the growth that's happened over the last uh, five or six years. Um, and you know, one of the, the, the key things that we're starting to see now is a strain on wallet. So we'll probably be facing a future of increased bundling so you know you take a mobile phone service you'll get netflix spotify you know as part of that that bundle uh, so you know i think the streaming wars will now become the bundling wars very shortly um, but there does seem to be a limit on the number of services that people are willing to take on and you know that's changing but i do think there's a constraint here I would say, you know, if we're looking at the uh, average in the US, it's around about $47 per month. That's three, three and a half services, more or less. Um, if I look at myself, I'm subscribed to seven, so I'm a bit of an anomaly on that scale. Uh, but again, you know, um, we're in this environment, particularly as you know, not everyone has access to a credit card, or you know, not have everyone has access to the fifty or sixty dollars it requires to maintain a Spotify subscription, a you know YouTube premium subscription, a Twitch account, you know, and then Netflix, HBO. You know, there's going to be a lot of pressure in this environment, and therefore, you know, these streaming services are going to have to look at other ways of retaining uh, users. But I think, you know, we, we are going to see that the studios will retain, you know, uh, their prime content on their prime services. Um, so some a studio like Disney Plus is in, a, I think, a good position to win the streaming wars because they've got a direct pipeline from their production houses straight into their, into their content platform. And the same with HBO. So now we have a beginnings of a new release model and it's going to be much more flexible. You know, it won't be theatrical or, and nothing. We're going to have certain films that are going to retain their theatrical window. 
we're going to have other films that will move straight, straight to some form of premium VOD pricing uh, with, you know, day and date release or exclusively in these platforms that are controlled by the big players. We're going to have an SVOD um, premium releases as well, as we've seen with Disney Plus, you know, certain movies were just released as part of the package or part of the subscription. And then you're going to see a lot of the hybrid staggered approaches, probably in the mid and independent tiers of the market will be something that will be part theatrical, part day and day, maybe exclusive. It'll just be negotiated around what the value or, or the potential value of that film could be. And I think that's going to be very, very interesting because, um, you know, the, the rigid flexibility of the window system before, I think, murdered the opportunity of a lot of films to survive and thrive in, in the business environment. Um, and I think this system is much fairer now because you're leaving it up to the distributor to figure out what they want to do with the film and what the potential is based on what type of film it is. So, one of the big things that we've, we're seeing coming out of the industry now is the move back towards advertising. Uh, and I think this will be the big white knight of the industry. Um, the AVOD model is going to drive so many conversations that I think really need to be had. One of them is we're probably facing a future where we're not going to be seeing as many streaming platforms trying to operate purely on a subscription model. We might be seeing a future whereby Netflix releases a certain amount of its content for free, but you have to watch ads. And I think, you know, from the agency perspective, um, linear TV has been, you know, in decline as more and more people cut the cord uh, and cancel their cable subscriptions um, or fast forward through ads. Uh, so the effectiveness of advertising on TV is really being brought into question as of late. I think AVOD will be, you know, the thing that the industry is going to really look forward to because it takes the pressure off the subscription model um, and allows content to travel. And there will be other funding of partners and opportunities now in the mix as the major agencies move their advertising dollars into, you know, uh, smart TV advertising and app, in-app advertising as well. So the AVOD model is, is kick, uh, off to a great start. You know, as far as we read from HBO Max's uh, initial discussions, you know, their book of ads sold out almost instantaneously. And there was a lot of bidding going on from the agencies to get access uh, to this inventory. I think that poses, you know, um, some good things for the content production industry. And just hoping that we don't get back to the crazy days of, you know, American cable television, where there's an ad on every seven minutes and you're still paying a subscription fee. I mean, that's, that was crazy and that needed to die. Um, in this instance, I'm hoping that the ads are pre-roll, post-roll and not interrupting the, the content experience itself. And, you know, just to put this into perspective, you know, here's a quick graph from Statista, which basically shows, you know, that the AVOD model is growing very, very quickly for certain types of content but it'll be ubiquitous within the next two to three years. And we have IMDB TV, which is releasing purely as an AVOD model. I believe Peacock is as well. Uh, Hulu is hybrid. Um, and we'll probably start to see a lot more hybrid action going on over the next few, uh, few years. But the great news is if you're a producer, the times have never been better. You know, there are more buyers in the market now than they've ever been before. And the budgets are incredible as everyone's trying to desperately create the next Star Wars franchise by the looks of things. So, you know, Netflix's budget is going from 19 billion per year to 26 billion by, 20, by 2026. Um, Disney's not that far behind, but as I said, the unsung hero of this, this you know, um, of these budgets is really YouTube because they figured out how to monetize producers without really having to invest in content. And I think the viewing patterns of, of, of audiences are very indicative that, of, that YouTube might be onto something here that is gonna be very powerful over the next few years. And that's, that's back to this idea of, you know, creating the content, which is at the mid tier level, which is an area which has been largely ignored and now you know, uh, Netflix recently released some of the viewing numbers on these, you know, shows and films. Uh, so yesterday, if anyone's seen that, is, you know, a good family friendly movie. It received 62 million viewers in the US. 
I mean, that's an incredible number. And we didn't know that in terms of what's been happening with the viewership because everything that goes into these platforms is in a black box. Uh, but I think there's some interesting moves coming out of the industry. And this is probably one of the other areas where these platforms will start to compete. You know, a producer will be interested in going into who will deliver the biggest audience uh, for my film. And this is where somewhere someone like Netflix can really shine because they have the audience, right? And so, you know, this is the first hint that in the future we might be facing um, the possibility that Netflix will be much freer with their data and producers will begin to understand how their films travel. The other great thing is local language content has gone bananas. So, you know, there are, you know, an incredible array of good TV series from all different parts of the world. Uh, I just uh, started watching To the Lake, uh, the Russian uh, apocalyptic um, series, and it was a thoroughly enjoyable show. And, you know, I think people have overcome the uh, issue with subtitles, um, primarily because I think as more TV is, as, as, as more film has moved towards TV, you know, the sound systems aren't as good as you would get in a cinema. And therefore having subtitles on, particularly when, when people are whispering is very important if you want to follow the plot of the film. And I think that has led into people become, becoming much more accepting of subtitles. And that is why we're suddenly starting to see this massive explosion of interesting storylines from Korea and Russia. And of course, those producers have, are not caught in the classic Hollywood writing arc. You know, so we're going to see, you know, different ways of telling stories beginning to bombard our, you know, our senses over the next few years. And I think that would be very good. Um, and certainly good for the diversity of talent that's coming out of the film schools internationally. Because all of a sudden, there's a much more democratic market to try and break into. Uh, so I, I really do think this is the golden age of the producers and the acting talent. On the downside, we're probably not going to see the explosive breakout successes of a Quentin Tarantino again, you know, because there'll just be so much content that's out there. I think if you look at Quentin Tarantino, not only was he a great filmmaker, but he was also an extra specially good businessman. And he knew how to work the festivals to really leverage his movies and leverage the value that he was getting out of those movies as well. And so that kind of stellar, you know, headline director, it might be falling by the wayside. Same with the stars. I think we're probably going to see a wider range of actors and actresses and some real talent. And the talent will be generally much, much better on average because there's more opportunity to get into exciting roles but we're probably not gonna have the same level of focus on A-list celebrities and the A-list celebrity clout that was used to measure the potential of films in, in the future. I think it's gonna be much more around the storyline and the marketing and how that does the storytelling before rather than you know, an actor uh, being the headline for drawing attention to a movie. And so, you know, I mentioned The Unsung Hero, which is YouTube here. Um, YouTube is expected um, to soon equal Netflix in revenue. I think that's an in incredible undertaking, considering that they're not really paying for content. Um, TikTok is the other platform that is worth keeping an eye on, but it's very much short, short form. What YouTube has proved more than anything else is people are quite willing to spend three or four hours listening to something if it's interesting. And it kind of goes counter to the media narrative that everything's got to be short form to grab attention nowadays. Good just goes to show if you have a following and your content's good, people will tune in for several hours to listen to you. And then I think the other thing that, that uh, YouTube really can capitalize on is they have thousands of franchises, right? Everyone's looking for the big Star Wars because Essentially, if you make a Star Wars movie, you know you're going to get a certain number of audiences that will come in and buy immediately because they're familiar with the, the, the universe, they're familiar with the storyline, and they're really looking forward to seeing the next installment. YouTube has essentially hedged that bet across, you know, well, probably more than thousands, millions of YouTube creators now. Some of them with huge followings like PewDiePie um, and Mr. Beast. And, you know, if I look at my kids again, that's primarily what they're watching. They're not watching 
children's television content in uh, on any of the official channels in Denmark. Um, so again, I think you know from a from a production standpoint, YouTube is you know a amazing place to test out ideas. So let's get down to the final bit, which which is why we're all here. What are my predictions for the next 10 years? So I think the first one is fairly obvious. Cinema is going to get better at giving the experience. They can't, they can't fudge the numbers anymore. Things are very desperate within the industry, but I think with desperation comes innovation. Uh, I think part of the reason why things haven't innovated was because there was no real need to, and that creates stagnation within the industry. I think we're going to see an explosion of startups and companies working with cinemas over the next 10 years. And I think the other thing is the experience will be an experience. So, you know, expect more cinemas along the, the style of Picture House and Every Man and Alamo um, to be uh, to be rising out of the industry over, over you know, in certainly within the next two years. Um, I, I, I've also made the prediction that studios will maintain their theatrical releases for certain blockbuster titles. So, you know, the Top Guns are still going to be exclusive in cinema, but the, day, the, the window will probably be shortened down to a max of 45 days instead of 90. Um, and we'll see the, the return of the mid-budget and small-budget um, mid-tier movie which I think will be great for production. And as you can see from the numbers that were reported by Netflix, there are still huge audiences out there that are not in the mood for a, you know, massive, you know, complex, uh, uh, you know, TV show or a very, you know, uh, big budget movie. They just want something happy and casual human drama story to, to, to get into. And I think that's, you know, that, that's going to be great for that sector of the film industry. Obviously, what we're going to also see is an explosion in foreign talent. You know, we're going to have actors and actresses and directors and producers coming from all different parts of the globe, telling really interesting stories. And now with the avenue of so many different streaming services to tap into and the rise of AVOD as well, you know, it's going to be very good for the production industry as a total and very good for the, for the universities that are turning out people into, um, you know, from the various film schools internationally. It's going to be a buzzing and vibrant market. And uh, I think that's great news for the industry. As we said, the theatrical model will become extremely flexible. We're going to see a lot of innovation in the, the windowing system itself, a lot of rights management. And alongside the rights management, we're going to have to start moving away from paper contracts. And I think that's where things like blockchain can come in and really streamline this process of very, very complicated agreements. So, you know, this will be one of the key areas of innovation that we'll see that not only will we have a flexible window, but we'll have a flexible licensing and contracting system that will be probably stored around some, you know, aggregation technology that makes things more transparent and fairer. Um, when I talk to my producer friends, you know, they're typically signing contracts with terms like, you know, throughout the university and in, in all perpetuity. And those bits of paper are stashed away with lawyers and everything like that. So, you know, the opportunities for rights infringements, you know, are massive within production. And most producers aren't aware which, you know, toes that they're stepping in. I think that's going to become much clearer downstream. So we're going to see um, crazy next few years with the streaming wars and I would say by 2031, we probably won't have as many big streaming platforms out there. There will probably be like the studios, maybe four or five large international ones and maybe one or two local ones. There might be a plethora of smaller niche VOD services catering for specific interests. I heard Dog TV is doing particularly well, like and as as well as uh, Horse TV. So I think specific niche VOD is is got a long way to go. But the big streaming platforms, it's all about scale. And you know, if if a studio can't afford that scale, um, then you know they're going to have to figure out other things to do with their movies. And of course, obviously, the ad funding model is one of those ways that you know, these opportunities can be exploited. But the big problem with pushing so much content out into environments where it's easy to get that content is 
piracy is absolutely spiking again. And I think that's the problem with the wallet um, limitations of subscription services is that the moment that a, a premiere film comes out, you know, like Wonder Woman 1984, the, um, the, there was a high res copy available uh, on most pirate sites within hours of the film being released in Australia. And then the other thing is that we, we start to see some changes and experimentation with different, um, you know, different viewing options. I think, you know, Netflix pioneered the binging model where you can watch everything in one go. Um, I think what we'll probably start to see with the content, which has been very heavily invested in and moved back towards the serialization or the weekly scheduling of episodes. Because one of the things, you know, that the, the binge watching does is it satiates an immediate desire to see the rest of the, the episodes that are available. The problem is by the time you got onto the third or fourth episode, your attention span is completely shattered because no one can concentrate for that long. And therefore people are skipping through <laughs> anything that they're deeming boring within a, uh, you know, within a binge session. And so what we'll probably start to see is content being divvied up into, you know, relatively low quality snackable content formats that will be suitable for binge. But the bigger investments, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings um, type series uh, will probably be serialized and scheduled weekly. Um, and then, you know, across the industry, what we're, you know, what we're most convinced of is the understanding of audience data will be the key driver for any kind of, you know, success or innovation within the industry. If we look at cinemas, if they really want to com compete with, you know, the Netflixes and the HBO Maxes. They're sitting on catchment areas of audiences around each of their locations. They have websites which are drawing in huge um, numbers of audiences each week you know if they wanted to to compete with vod then we're going to start to see a lot of innovation happening within the space of audience data and how that audience data is used both for business intelligence purposes but also in the process of the campaign so we might be getting to a future whereby recommendations are coming through ads uh, rather than purely you know serendipitous discovery or recommendations from from friends and that's because you know the platforms that have the audience will start to invest in technologies that allow them to understand the desires of the audience better but also to market to them directly so with leading into that this is our main product that we've been investing in for the last three years You'll, if you see anything to do with Groovy, you'll probably see that we'll be talking about the audience project or TAP for short. In the trials that we've been running, one of the things that we've noticed is when we incorporate cinema uh, purchase behavior data into a campaign, it generally raises the campaign effectiveness between three and five times on average. And that's actually tickets sold. So I think this is a vastly underused, utilized um, opportunity for the cinema industry as a whole. And we're in the process of raising money now uh, to capitalize on this. As I said earlier on in this, uh, in this podcast, um, we, we just recently won a grant for Stadium, which is Horizon 2020 money. And we'll be building a prototype with 16 cinemas in Europe. We're also raising money through the UK Innovation Fund for UK cinemas uh, specifically. So if you're operating or owning a cinema in either of those markets, do reach out because we're going to have uh, budgets for research and development into this space going forwards. If you're interested in sort of listening to our updates and finding out you know, more about the industry, we run a bi-weekly show uh, called That's Entertainment on LinkedIn. If you uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, you'll be updated every time the show uh, is pushed live. We're also running a series of webinars um, about data and information and business practices within the industry. Um, we are focusing on different sort of verticals. Uh, we've, we've done everything from cinema through to the agency approach. Uh, the next thing that we'll probably start to look at is licensing. Um, and we'll be working with various partners like Ushu, Vula and uh, other companies um, that are working specifically in those spaces to push those narratives forwards. But for us, innovation is really, really important. Um, 
I think it's such a fantastic industry with so many untapped opportunities. Uh, and you know, we're, we're very, very positive around the future. It's just gonna become much more specialized. And I think a lot of the old ways of doing things quite rightly are falling by the wayside now. But you know, as you can see from this presentation, there's huge optimism for growth as well.